Okay, hey everybody. So, oh my god, got it. Um, unfortunately, we only have two hours and to cover data visualization adequately, um, take you a couple of years. <laughs> so you get the super abridged version of it. Or I'll give you the cheat code later to use AI to solve all your visualization problems. Um, so here's what we're gonna do. Maybe in about half an hour, I wanna give you some sort of high level, sort of theoretical type stuff to help you get grounded in visualization. And then the rest of it, we wanna show you some common visualization tools that you might find useful, like Plotly, Airview, Tableau. And then we got a little survey, of course, that you guys have to answer. Okay. Um, I have to apologize. All this stuff originally I had slides, so I had to transcribe everything into English. Should have used Chat GPT, um, and I'm not too proud to do that either. Uh, but if we run out of time, what I'm going to do is I will skip some of this stuff, but at least all the text is there, so you can read that later. Um, so. Here's what we want to try to talk about today. First of all, right here at the top, um, I want to start by giving you an example of what's a good visualization. So start with a good, get your neurons trained around one good example. And then I want to hopefully increase your awareness of what a bad visualization looks like so that I hope you de develop an allergic reaction maybe to bad visualizations. And then when you're walking down the street and you go, oh man, that's a bad visualization. Okay. Um, and then after that, you know, now that you're, you're critics, everyone's a critic, what are you gonna do about it? I wanna try and give you some tips on how to make you know, good visualizations. Um, and then lastly, before I finish you know, yammering on, I want to show you a, web, a couple of websites where you get to see examples of really, really amazing visualizations uh, that you cannot simply do using a lot of the tools that you normally use to do your science, unfortunately. Okay. And so that's ideally uh, something I hope you can look at to ins you know, inspire you to produce even more creative visualizations. And lastly, we'll talk about the tools. Okay. So, I think for the, for a lot of you, since you guys are scientists, the first rule of visualization for you guys is make that chart so you can put it in your research paper, right? That's usually what goes on in people's minds, right? But there's much more to it. Uh, I encourage you to start visualizing the moment you have data, even as you're collecting it, because sometimes the sensors are collecting wrong data and you don't know it until you look at it. Um, now, data visualization is great for looking at large amounts of data. It's good at letting you see scale uh, and complexity all at the same time. Helps you discover unintended emergent features in the data. Uh, hopefully helps you answer questions about the data. But more importantly, as a scientist, it creates new questions for you about what's going on in the phenomenon. Okay? And then, Lastly, your science isn't going to really matter unless you can convey it to somebody who can then turn it into something actionable that will really change the world. And to do that, you have to be able to tell a good story about with your data, okay? So let's start with a good example of visualization. And, and some of you may have seen this. This is a really old visualization. It's in all the classical visualization books because it is so good. And this is also somewhat timely about somebody marching to invade Moscow and, and so forth. Uh, so about Moscow and Russia. Uh, but it was Napoleon on his little trip to Moscow trying to invade Moscow. And, and then this is actually the size of his army at the, at the beginning of the campaign. This is the size of the army on his way back right there. And so uh, what you're seeing here are multiple dimensions of data simultaneously. So the size of these lines, the size of the, the army, um, the black line is the return trip right here. You have also, for example, major river crossings like here and here. 
Notice that when there's a river crossing, what happens? A bunch of people die off, right? And then, of course, here you've got the temperature, which is really dropping fast as it's approaching, well, it's gone into winter, basically, right? And so there's a correlation between lack of food and resources, cold, and as a result, people die. Um, so this is one of the best visualizations you know, that's ever made because it encodes so many different data sets into one picture, right? And it tells a story. You can tell a story with the visualization. So let's look at some bad visualizations, right? So most of you think, well, probably, you probably think, I can do tables. Don't need to teach me about how to make tables because Microsoft Excel does tables. Well, this is a typical table, actually, when you plug it into a lot of uh, uh, you know, programs that generate, that work with Excel spreadsheets. So if you were to show this to a visualization person, they would probably throw up. Uh, and the makeover is something like this. So like this. So this is the made over version, right? So this is like celebrity makeovers kind of thing, ugly, better, right? And what I hope you sort of get from seeing the two is hopefully when you look at the bottom one, emotionally, you feel a little more relaxed. There's, you know, nice clean spaces around your data. So the data doesn't feel like it's really suffering and cramped in this little box, right? But readability wise, hopefully you see this is far more readable. Uh, this is far more readable than this, right? For example, for numbers, you want to align them right justified, right? So that way you can help magnitudes. Decimal points, same thing but aligned on the decimal point. Text, it's easier to read when left justified. It's been shown that if you center justify text, it's actually harder and it takes longer for someone to read text. So the temptation is to center justify this stuff, right? So the only time you would center justify would be the title because it makes it look balanced, right? But even then, look at all the spacing around it, right? Normally, when you plug this into most graphing or charting programs, it will not impose this additional spacing to give the user the sense of relief about looking at the data. And then this is actually a picture taken directly from Microsoft Excel back in the late 90s. Nowadays, you would never get a chart this bad anymore in the modern Viz tool. So things are progressing, right? But what do you see from this that hurts your eyes right off the bat? Tilting your head to see the numbers. Tilting your, your head to see the labels is horrible. Um, you know, sometimes the labels are too long and you can't help it. But look at the colors, like the yellow in particular, right? You can't see where that line is, right? Microsoft used to pick basically eight colors from its color palette. Red, green, blue, cyan, magenta, black, white, and yellow. The reason for doing that is if you take R, G, and B, and push all their values to their maximum levels, you get exactly those colors, right? And historically, those computers only do like 8-bit color. Nowadays, all your computers can do 32-bit, which means you have, oh, for like 16 to 32 million colors. So there's no reason to pick from this palette ever anymore. Okay. Uh, pie charts. People in the financial world love pie charts. Pie charts, if you talk to a data viz person, pie charts are probably the worst chart in the world. There's almost no reason to ever use a pie chart. There are always better ways of doing it. So here's an example, and even worse, uh, nowadays, like you know, uh, Apple's uh, numbers, right? It makes cool charts, but they're always 3D, right? And the problem with 3D charts is this distortion. So you see this 29%, it looks bigger than the 35%. And you will typically see this used a lot during political campaigns, especially on <clears throat> Fox News, <laughs> right? Because you're trying to create an impression about the data and you're trying to fool the, fool the, the audience into seeing something that's not there, right? Um, we'll talk more about pie charts in a second. 
here's another thing where if you look at 3D as far as distortion by perspective, this appears so much bigger because of that distorting effect. Notice also the slope here. The reason why this appears more slopey is because the values start at 20 whatever million, right? Instead of zero. So oftentimes, again, for political data reporting, they might say, well, the population of the United States is skyrocketing like you wouldn't believe. But if you were to just plot it with a zero on the axis, the slope is not there anymore. Now, there's a trade-off because what you're taught in science is you want to optimize this graph so that all the data points fit in, within the within the graphs of the data's range, right? Because you can see maximally what's going on in the detail. And that is totally valid, but just be aware that that's gonna have a perception, you're gonna create a perceptual bias for someone who's a, not a scientist, right? There's, a, there's an extra hidden message there that could be happening. So be careful about that. And also, so these numbers are really hard to interpret. I literally have to figure out how many commas there are, 270 million, that's it. So help the viewer, put some commas in like that, right? Just make it easier for them. Okay, now presenting a chart. So many of you make charts and you talk about them uh, during your presentations. Most of the time people uh, just talk through the chart and that's it. And they say, here's the, here's the chart I found and the result is this. Problem is most people trying to read a chart needs the time to actually read the chart itself. So you literally have to walk them through by saying, this is a chart I made, it's a comparison of power to weight ratio and lap times on the Laguna Seca track for 19 cars. On the, on the uh, vertical axis, and you literally should tell them and explain it. On the vertical axis, you've got power to weight ratio, where bigger is better. On the horizontal axis, you've got lap time, basically smaller is better, right? And lastly, the thing you should always add is a conclusion for what this chart is trying to say, because you can't guarantee the audience is going to be able to interpret this. There's a study that showed that only 40%, no, 40 percent of the audience cannot understand basic charts. So, that means they're not gonna get a clue what this is about. So you have to have a conclusion. So the conclusion is you achieve the best lap times with cars that are lighter and more powerful. Okay? So just simply put it there as the punchline. That punchline helps the audience, but it also helps you because what's gonna happen as a researcher is that you'll make stacks and stacks of PowerPoints and go and give them presentations. And one day you're gonna be asked to give another presentation. You have to bring these charts back and you're gonna go, Crap, what was, that, what was the conclusion on that one again? And you have to reinterpret the chart. Save yourself that by putting the conclusion right there. Okay, okay back to pie charts. Pie charts are really good for showing how much pie you've eaten. They're really only good for comparing two or three things, not more. And here's an example. These are three very different pie charts with different values. Compare that with bar charts, right? They're really bad at comparing within themselves and between themselves. You know, you're not saving any space by making a bar chart or a pie chart, right? It's the same amount of space and it communicates the data far more effectively. If you're trying to hide something, by all means, you use a pie chart. And sometimes you will get your boss asking you, I need a pie chart of this. And you might say, but you know, theoretically a bar chart is actually better. And your boss might say, you're fired. <laughs> so um, listen to your boss, but at the same time, also be willing to say that, you know, this, this could distort the way the data looks. Do you still want to proceed, right? Make it, you know, make it known. Um, okay, um, this is the same point, so I'll skip that. But again, this pie chart, if you show it as just a bar chart, it's so much simpler, right, than looking at this. Um, yeah, okay, fonts. 
right? So it doesn't, you don't have to use a lot of fancy fonts. I can give you a rule of thumb how many fonts you should use and when you should use them. And then your anxiety will release and you never have to think about this ever again. Um, this, you just Google for funny fonts, uh, you know, and you'll see lots of this kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, this one is great. So this, this problem here with the, the rapist, the therapist, that's called kerning, the space between fonts, right? Uh, bad fonts have poor kerning, and as a result, you get this stuff, or this one. This is bad kerning, so it's 10 fuckering lights, right? Um, here's some very simple guidelines, very simple guidelines. Generally, and this has been studied in user studies, fonts like without uh, serifs, sans serif fonts, Helvetica, Arial, are really good for on-screen text, because generally you have less resolution on the screen than on paper. Serif fonts like Times, Georgia, Roman, they're, they're actually really good for print. Uh, monospace fonts are better for code and numbers, right? Because then you can see the alignment of the, the, the code and, then, and the numbers. Stylish fonts, um, <clears throat> save them for your parties. Right? Lowercase words are read faster than uppercase. So try not to have stuff that's, sorry about this, <laughs> everything in uppercase. It takes your brain longer to read something that's all uppercase than it is in lowercase. Now, the only exception is for nonsensical words, like for example, United Airlines 113A, right? These are not really English words. It's okay to have them in uppercase. And it's actually easier to perceive those in uppercase. And if you're still in doubt about which fonts to use, again, it's back to that feel, right? These are serif fonts. They give you a sense of tradition, old Englishness, right? Reliabilities, comfort. Whereas this gives you a sense of stability. And then you've got elegance and strong and, you know, happy, friendly, right? So depending on what you're trying to convey, this is a really simple and good way to choose your fonts. And if in doubt, if you don't know what to do, just do either Helvetica or Arial, okay? Okay, here's the process. So what does a, what does a, you know, a visualization person do when they, they try to make a visualization? First thing is, you, who's your audience, right? So who is this visualization for? What is the level of understanding of the subject matter? Right? Most of us as scientists, we tend to put charts that most audiences don't understand because we have too many jargony things in it, right? too many units that don't, don't, aren't intelligible to a, a normal person. So, but you can augment that by having at least labeling to make it understandable. Uh, ask yourself before you even consider making the visualization, what is its purpose? Are you trying to verify, confirm something that you think is inside the data? Are you trying to discover something new? Are, do you have a bunch of questions you wanna ask? Are there hypotheses you're trying to answer? And what's the story you're trying to tell? So whenever we as visualization people work with other scientists, that's the set of questions we always ask them because then we know exactly what kind of visualizations they want. So once you figure out what the questions are, you figure out what are the data attributes that you need to plot something to answer them, right? And so each grouping of attributes could be considered one chart that has to be plotted. And so you can do this as an exercise on post-it notes. You can say, okay, these are the, this is a COVID example. These are all the variables, all the attributes in my data. These are the questions I want to answer. How are the number of cases of COVID trending? What is the growth rate of COVID's death? Uh, COVID deaths, what are the main hotspots? So for each question, what are the variables that you need to, to answer that? Well, the cases in time. For this question, you need deaths in time. For this question, you need whatever, right? And then you say, okay, out of these variables, what is the best chart to actually plot using these parameters? And you can make little post-it notes for this too, once you've made these post notes, then you can start arranging, make your dashboard. And so that's basically the step that we go through. 
So when we worked with Tom Jambaluka on his climate stuff, we went through exactly that. He, he was kind of like, why are we doing this to us? But at the end of the process, I think he really enjoyed what RJ has been doing with him. Like it really wowed him that, wow, we can really produce some really amazing ways of visualizing data just by going through this process. And so if you were to go through this process, you might end up with a dashboard you know, like this, right, for COVID. This was actually done by one of my students just for fun at some point and during COVID basically. <laughs> There's nothing else you could do during COVID. Okay. So now, so now that you kind of know what the general steps are, the question is how do you pick the right chart for your particular purpose? Well, fortunately nowadays, there are some really good chart guys. So there's one on the left by this gentleman, uh, his last name's Abella. You click on this, it actually brings up this little, kind of like a decision tree. So you, you, they would ask you, what would you like to show? Well, I'd like to show a comparison. A comparison of what? Among items, uh, two variables or one variable. You sort of follow this branch branching structure and eventually it'll recommend a chart for you, okay? So for a long time, this was the only chart guy that was out there. Now there are really other really good ones like this one from data to viz, where you could say, you know, numeric data, two variables, three numeric variables, and then it will basically run down the types of charts that would make sense. You click on them and it'll tell you a little bit more about them, right? So this is a really good guide you can use if you absolutely have no idea. And also sometimes you want to look at chart types that are potentially more effective than the ones that you've already been using, right? Maybe most of the time you've been using bar charts, line charts, and pie charts, right? Hopefully not pie charts anymore, right? Um, and you're wondering, well, if I can't use my pie chart, what should I use? Gosh, darn it. Um, hopefully this will sort of give you ideas for other more effective charts you could use. Now, where you ultimately want to go and aspire to is there's so many wonderful sites nowadays, like uh, Information is Beautiful. Anyone heard of Information is Beautiful before? So, oh, well, because you took my class. <laughs> yeah, so if you click on this, right, this guy or this group of folks basically takes data from various, you know, scientific, um, areas and tries to explain the science behind them by making these really exquisite charts, right? And it's like, gosh darn it, I wish I could make these charts. Um, the sad part about this is like this one, what does all the food, world's food come from? So this is called a Sankey chart, right? If you look in real close, it says, this, this is whole grains, wheat, rice. You can see that these lines show the proportion come from different places in the world, right? Well, unfortunately, most of the visualization tools, actually all of the visualization tools that you use, like MATLAB, Matplotlib, Plotly, whatever, uh, Tableau, will not do any of these really sexy visualizations. Because at this stage, uh, these are handcrafted by people who are really like you know, graphic artists. Now, this could be a really cool topic for generative AI, maybe train it on a whole bunch of this stuff and to make good charts in the future. And then that's certainly an active uh, area of study. So if you look at another site, the best viz and infographics are climate change facts, right? If I scroll through them, they've got really clever, different ways of displaying, you know, climate change type stuff that you wouldn't normally get from the packages that you normally use. Uh, oh, this one is from NASA, right? You, some of you probably seen this one, right? This is not really, well, this is sort of, but not really, this is an animated version of it, but not really a standard chart you use in a lot of data visualization tools. This one has become real popular, right? People are now making flags out of them and t-shirts and, I think somebody did it to their Tesla as well. Um, basically, you know, climate uh, temperature rise over time. 
right? Like this. Okay, we've got to move on. Um, so I encourage you, you know, take a peek at these links now and then to get inspiration. And then this part is where it goes a little bit deeper, right? I, I don't think I'm going to have time to go through this, but basically what this is trying to explain is what happens to your brain when you look at a visualization? How is your brain processing? And so there are three parts. There's the iconic memory, which is the stuff that your brain detects without you consciously even having to try. You know, like a car about to hit you. You know that, oh shit, I gotta do something about it, right? Uh, vis visual working memory is, you know, you hear about, you can only keep seven things in your head at, this, at one time, right? That kind of stuff. Long-term memory is stuff that you already know well, like your science, right? And so for making a good visualization, what you're trying to do is engage all these three parts of your brain. And the term for this part where you're, you're, you're able to detect something without thinking about it, it's called pre-attentive thinking, right? So things like color are pre-attentively detect. That's why color is so useful at visualization. Size, pre-attentively detected, right? So actually, right here, orientation, curvature, length, numerosity, added check marks, width. These are all pre-attentively detected. You don't have to struggle to think about it. Those are the primitives that you use to make the charts from. Motion, flickering, velocity, all pre-attentively detected. Yes. Uh, it turns out stereoscopic depth is the most rapidly pre-attentively detected cues. So you know, most of you like, you know, remember in 3D movies came out, you say, oh, that's just a gimmick. So if 3D were a gimmick, I think evolution would have removed one of these eyeballs by now. But, but the fact of the matter is, our ability to detect 3D is detected faster by your brain than any other cue. So faster than color, faster than size, faster than brightness. Why do you think that is? Survival, right? All of this is about survival. When you have something jumping at you, that is gonna trigger a depth response faster than before you can tell, oh, that was a red tiger or a blue tiger. <laughs> The first thing you want to know is, oh shit, is it going to eat, jump on me right now, right? And so, I mean, even looking at this, all we I'm doing here, although it's not stereoscopic, we're flipping the color map and immediately your brain tells you, this is popping out, this is going in. All these are pre-attentively detected. Color, and, and so that kind of brings us to color. And I think uh, Laura talked about color for a bit, right? And she probably talked about these color tools that you can use to give you good examples of color. The only thing I'm gonna show you about this color one is this one. Someone did a study for all the different color maps that you typically use in scientific visualizations. How effective are they? And most of you, most of the scientific community uses this one, which actually turns out to be not very good. And you know, funny thing is, Visualization researchers didn't realize this until probably the last decade when they actually did a concerted user study. Because um, you notice that with these this, this set of colors, the values, the, the actual colors themselves don't constitute a linear band. So they're real, even though the, the, all these are, you know, this is along a linear axis. You don't have an even number of yellows to greens to blues to, to reds, right? This green seems to occupy a much larger space perceptually, right? And it gets even worse if you're colorblind because this entire area is, is totally useless to somebody who's colorblind. And so somebody finally did a study and you can go to this website for it to compare all these different color maps to figure out where do you get the mean amount of uh, uh, resolution error when someone looks at a data visualization. And this turned out to be the winner. Interesting, right? Probably the, not the one that most people would ever use. Uh, I think a lot of geoscientists tend to use like this one. Uh, some of the tools use this one and this one, but not this one. Right? And so here's the problem. 
So now that you're equipped with this information, you'll probably want to use this one. Uh, traditional geosciences might use this one. What do you do? And so you need to, you still need to preserve this because sometimes people want to look at old papers and compare against your new results. So the, the trick is you, in your software, produce the ability to do two different color maps so that hopefully one day you'll train the new generation of scientists to use a better color map while you can still look at the old data. Anyway, that's my very short guide to color. Anyway, that's a whole separate lecture on its own. Um, by the way, if you look at all these different color maps, on these different, uh, well, the same data, you can see different color maps resolve features better than others, right? And I don't know, anybody colorblind? Some, you might not even be able to see what's going on in some of these, right? So anyway, um, there's more to tell. <laughs> I can't cover it all in, in two hours when it's a semester long class, but the, the field data visualization, you have everything from information visualization, geospatial network visualization, medical visualization, uncertainty visualization, persuasive visualization, and also infrastructure. Um, so so that's, that's that. Uh, I wanna jump to now the tools of the trade. So today we're gonna talk about Plotly and Paraview and Tableau. And they're all here, which I'll jump into to talk about in more detail. But before I do that, I just want to say one last thing, since this is Black History Month. Um, this is W.E.B. Du Bois. He, he was like the first African-American earning a doctorate um, at Harvard uh, and became a professor later at Atlanta University. So he and his students had to make a bunch of visualizations for the World's Fair in 1900. This is 1900. So no computers yet. And what he wanted to show was basically uh, a visualization. And he had made a whole bunch of different visualizations. He, in this one, he's assessing the valuation of all taxable property owned by you know, Georgia uh, African-Americans, right? And so uh, the point was he wanted to show even, you know, despite all the hurdles that African-Americans had to go through, as far as segregation and so forth, they were still a viable commercial community, right? And what's, what's unique about this chart, again, it's not a chart that comes from Plotly. Plotly doesn't have one of these charts. It's really an infographic that's artistically crafted, right? And so what's unique about this is he could have done a pie chart, but he did, instead he did this weird chart. And what happens when your eyes see this right off the, off the bat? There's this like gravity well. Your eyes are drawn to the center, right? Center being black, African-American black. And then the radius of each one of these is the growth of uh, the revenues over time, the valuations over time. But because you're doing these overlap, you can't see, you can't really highlight what that overlap looks like anymore. So that's why he decided to put these wedges in. Because this color here actually permeates the entire circle is what he's saying. This red actually permeates the entire circle, right? I don't, I mean, I don't know if it's intended to be informative as much as it's intended to be evocative, right? Uh, if it's evocative, he succeeded, right? Uh, and then this one, you ever seen a line chart that wrapped around? doesn't do that, right? So, but this is really clever. The reason, and, and only that, what he did was, you see all these, these are all the different jobs, right? And, and basically the occupations, right? Different areas. But notice here, something that most people don't do is that he's taking all these minute jobs because oftentimes when you look at a chart like this, a politician might say, well, these are minute jobs. They don't amount to much. But here he's done the homework for you and done the aggregation for you. So that's really clever. But also the reason why this bending is really clever is that if he didn't bend this around, this chart would have extended out off the edge. And that means that everything else would have to scale down. And if you scale everything down, these things disappear, which means that the representation of these smaller jobs 
disappear, right? So a lot of careful thought was put into making this chart. Okay, any questions so far? This is interesting? Okay, hope so. <laughs> if not, just throw a tomato or something. Uh, okay, so let's look at Plotly. So why Plotly? You guys know probably MATLAB, right? Matt, no, sorry, MATPLOTLIV. And what else do you use besides MATPLOTLIV? Seaborn, okay. Anyone use Plotly right now? No? Okay. If you're using MATPLOTLIV, Seaborn, just stick to those. <laughs> the reason I'm bringing up Plotly is because, um, so I have to teach this class for an audience of computer scientists and people from other disciplines, right? And uh, computer scientists will want something that works in JavaScript, Python. Now other disciplines will want things that work in R, Python, and something else, and you know, uh, and MATLAB or whatever. Plotly seems to be the only API that literally works across everything. So including JavaScript, Python, what have you. So now you've got front-end graphics if you want it, or you can do back-end rendered graphics if you want to do the Python stuff. So that's why. Uh, the other, I think the big benefit to Plotly is that I think most of Matplotlib charts are static charts, right? Although you can, I think, do interactivity if you code for it. Uh, Plotly are de by default are dynamic charts, which is kind of nice. And in visualization, user interaction is almost like 60% of the insight. Like the ability to turn on and off different things, spin things, just look at it from a different angle, right? So, um, and it's not hard to learn. And not only that, let's say I, I can't code worth a darn. I'm really terrible at Python. I'm really terrible at JavaScript. Can you help me? Well, Plotly, the, 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 the company that offers it, and it's open source, by the way, they have something called Chart Studio. And in Chart Studio, you can log in with a free account, upload data, and make charts and make dashboards. And then you hit the export button, and it shows you the code. Which you can then copy into your program and, and draw. So that's some of my cheat things that my students do in my CS class when they're having trouble trying to make the chart they want. They do it in here first and then they copy the code and try it out. Um, so that's, that's another big advantage of it. And lastly, there's something called Dash, which is basically Plotly's way of make, letting you make custom dashboards. So let's say you made a whole bunch of charts, you want it to persist forever, like a, as a dashboard for people to look at. Dash is an API in Python to let you do that. Um, here's, here's some example code for Plotly. And you're probably familiar with this. This is the SQL data, data the flower data, right? The iris data. But basically, you know, after importing Plotly, you could do fig figure equals x um, Plotly Express scatter. And then some data points, the X values, the Y values, and then that's it. Uh, and then you do fig show to show the, to show the figure. This is code. And you know you just had that, that demo of pandas. You know, load this into pandas data frame right here, right? This, this the, the, the iris data. Column names are here. And tell Plotly to make scatter plot of x and y with, with uh, sepal width and sepal length. And it looks like that, nothing surprising. You can also make it do a scatter matrix, just one, one line. Oops, there's a missing parentheses. And it looks like that. Okay. Um, let me skip this part. And I want to show you something in Sage. It's kind of nifty. So, you know, you guys have seen me showing off Sage. And I think a Andy was trying to do this also last time and we weren't quite ready yet. So one of the coolest things in Sage, um, and this is what maddie has been working on, Maddie Belke, is I can bring up a kernel dashboard, right? And I can make my own kernel, Jason's kernel. 
right? Um, I can click on it and I can open the stage cell. This is essentially the equivalent of the Jupyter stage uh, cell, right? I can take, for example, that bit of code that you saw here. Like say this part, just this part, for example. Right? Paste it in, hit go and hope to God doesn't crash. And hope, oh yeah, okay. Oh, go, go. It wouldn't work when I'm giving a demo. RJ's checking why it's not working, right? Oh, it did work, it did finish, okay. So let me paste the rest of the code in and let me run this one. Hopefully it works. Oh, oh, sorry, I have to select a kernel. Select Jason as the kernel, kernel Jason. Run. Uh, yeah, hold on. Uh, so let me let me show you one more thing, and then and then we'll do the ggplot thing too. So here's another one I can bring up. Um, bring up Sage Cell. Just in here. Close this paren because it's a missing one. Select Jason's kernel. I'll run this. Okay. Normally it doesn't take that long, but you know eventually it'll, it'll pop up with the chart. And so, what's cool about the Sage cells is that, uh, you know, while you've been working with like Jupyter Lab, um, like this, right? You guys are familiar with the way Jupyter Lab is like this, right? It's all a linear notebook. What Sage cells will basically let you do is create fully two dimensional layout of, of cells, which makes it a lot easier to look at stuff, right? And, and the folks, our collaborator at Virginia Tech did a user study and they basically found that people much prefer a spatialized layout of cells than this fully linear one. But um, if you are a staunch advocate of the straight on linear linearity, what you could do is you can take your Jupyter Lab notebook and you can drag it into Sage. Watch my fingers. There it is. And the other cool feature is maybe maybe Jupyter Lab can do this too, but this Sage cell is a collaborative editor. So a friend of yours could go in and fix the code for you, or you can have him or her add new uh, code cells. And then the last thing I want to say about this plot, these stuff is so now you, you, you're all familiar with chat GPT, right? If you haven't, um, you should try it. It's, it's a lot of fun. So what's kind of cool about ChatGPT now, or actually it's been there for a while, is show me the correlation between uh, sepal width and length uh, as a plotly chart. So if you're not great at coding, never fear, uh, ChatGPT is here. Uh, the code looks, you know, pretty good. Now there are some, and it will make some mistakes. Like I gave it a four dimensional, let's say plot these four dimensions and it said scatter 4D and there is no scatter 4D function. 
right? That, that in, in computer terms, they call it hallucination. Here's hallucinating. I guess it wish is a scatter for the function, but just keep that in mind, it's not perfect, but it's an incredibly good crutch for how to do this. And this has been, you know, it's gonna be a real game changer in the future. Oh, so the, the ggplot question. Uh, ggplot, I think they're mostly uh, non-interactive charts, right? The good thing about ggplot is that it's based on something called the grammar of graphics. It's a, it is well-established uh, theory on how good visualizations are, 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 are produced, good visualization systems are produced. Uh, there are other tools like Vega Light that are also based on this grammar of graphics. You don't want to read the grammar of graphics, by the way. Well, you could. It's like this thick, right? Um, uh, but uh, that's the basis for a lot of the methodology in, visualize, in information visual, visualization, statistical visualization tools like ggplot, uh, plotly, uh, and so forth. So it is a, ggplot is a good tool, uh, just not really from the interactive point of view. And so for most computer scientists, I would recommend plotly just because you have the most versatility in the kinds of things you can do to help people from different disciplines and applications. All right, any other questions? Yeah, are you moving on past this one? Yeah. Is there, I was just wondering if it's programs in Python, how does the JavaScript kind of calculate? Oh, so you can either do these charts only in JavaScript or you can do it entirely in Python and make charts. Uh, Dash has a full set of APIs that mirror a lot of HTML stuff as well. So you never ever have to do, you know, when you make a front end, you have to do HTML, you have to do CSS, then you have to write the JavaScript, then you do the graphics on top of that. Uh, Dash does it all within Python. It will generate the HTML, the CSS, everything. So it's, it's pretty cool for making dashboards. So since you mentioned that, and I, I wasn't going to cover it today, um, what you can do if you're interested is, you know, after you've made your dashboard in, um, in Dash, you want to deploy your dashboard on a service somewhere, right? So you either have to have your own server to, that, can, that you can run a Python thing going, a server, or there are lots of services starting to emerge where you can host your Python stuff, right? One of them I found is Python Anywhere, right? And so if you want, a quick set of uh, walkthrough instructions. Click on this video, and it'll show you how to get a Dash app into Python anyway. Yeah, cool. So the, the last thing I want to talk about is our view. Now, I don't think, unfortunately, I don't think um, most of you would use Paraview in this co cohort of uh, fellows, uh, but I'm, I'm doing it just for completeness because, you know, next, next year, next semester, they may be folks who, 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 who might find this useful. Um, but who knows, maybe down the road, you might work in this area. So Paraview. Uh, so Paraview, so everything you've heard so far has been about statistical visualizations. Okay? Uh, or sometimes we call it information visualization before it was called, well, statistic first, now it's called information visualization. Paraview is for what we call scientific visualization. So most of you are thinking, well, I, we do science already. Why isn't what we do scientific visualization? It's because scientific visualization typically is used to describe things that where something has some natural inherent representation. Like for example, uh, the human body. When you look at an MRI scan of yourself and you see the tissues in 3D, you've seen these, right? Like 3D MRIs, that's, a natural thing and has a natural sort of representation to it. And you're just trying to visualize what's there, right? So that's typically how you sort of distinguish scientific visualization from information or information visualization where things tend to be more abstract. Like if I were to say, tell you, ask you, you know, make me a picture of the stock market. The stock market isn't really real, it's abstract. So that's, that would fall under information visualization. Whereas if you were to, um, back to this one, if you were to look at these things, right? This is basically a tornado, right? Or this is the wind flowing around a car, 
This is the human body. This is the formation of clusters of galaxies. They're all sort of have some sort of naturalistic physical representation. So that's typically what we call scientific visualization. Scientific visualization uh, in terms of using big data came far beyond before the information visualization stuff. Information visualization back then, it was basically uh, you know, people in business making a few little charts with small data. And scientific visualization, they have terabytes of data they have to visualize. They use supercomputers to do it. Now it's starting to flip around almost, right? The, uh, you know, the, the folks in business need to look at terabytes of customer data to find trends. Um, so anyway, so anyway, so Paraview is one of the most widely used uh, scientific visualization tools in the world. Uh, the other competitor, competitor to it is Visit. You may hear that. Um, it's really, it's a pretty complex tool, but there are lots of good online tutorials. This is what it kind of, oops, let me, yeah. Um, this is kind of what it looks like when you start out. So let me launch it. I just realized I was swearing throughout my presentation and this is recorded. Oh, well. <laughs> There's a study that said people who swear a lot tend to be more honest. So I, I'm way too honest. Yes. Um, so this is part of you when it starts, right? So you can close it. Oh, by the way, this is a good place to start for you guys. You can have a, you can click on getting started. And what it does, it gives you one very simple getting started guide, right? Um, so, for, so for example, I can open up a data set this is one of the built-in data sets. This is a, looks like nothing. Uh, but first I turn on all the data values and apply it. So this is a can and this is a block that's gonna get rammed into the can. And if I run it, it kind of looks like that, right? So this is something like a finite element analysis or simulation that you normally expect to see in engineering, right? You know, when things crush or when a car crashes into something, right? I can cycle it, kind of looks like that, right? Um, I can look at one of the parameters, like, I don't know, velocity. I think that's velocity. And I can apply color to it. I can take the data and I could apply glyphs to it. Glyphs are basically these little markers and these are arrows. Uh, I'm going to have it also show velocity. And scale factor, I'm gonna dial this down to 0.004. Then if I apply it, run it, I, I see correction for the velocities and the size of the stick. Each pin is basically the magnitude. Okay. Um, I can also make, oops, oh my, whoops, okay. I can make additional charts like histogram view of some of the data values. So where's my histogram? Oh, turn it on first, here you go. So these are histogram values of one of the parameters, ACCL. Honestly, I don't know what ACCL means. I'm gonna guess it's acceleration. Right? So it's like a time varying histogram or you can do velocity. So this is a histogram of all the velocities across all the data sets. You can obviously stop it and step through it. So you can imagine for an engineer or for someone who studies climate science and does simulations of, you know, vorticities for tornadoes, this would be a very you know, useful tool for them. Um, very quickly, this is my pipeline browser. So, you know, basically this is how you build your processing pipeline to do filtering and then generation of different kinds of visual representations to, to draw in this space. 
this changes the parameters. This is your visualization space. And, um, and that's about it. Um, this tool has the ability to read in uh, about 220 different file formats. And so anything from DICOM, which is medical data uh, for like x-rays and MRIs, to NetCDF, which is for climate simulations, read in. Uh, the cool thing about DICOM is the next time you go to your doctor's office, get an MRI done, um, you can ask them for the data and it'll be DICOM and you can bring it into this and you can get a 3D model of like, you know, your colon or something. I knew a researcher who did that. He actually gave a talk about, he has colon problems and he studies, tried to start studying his mi gut microbiome and uh, got the DICOM data, made a visualization of it and he wasn't satisfied with it, so he made a 3D printed version of it. And then at the end of the talk, he pulls out his 3D printed colon. So I was more of a theatric, but it was kind of fun how passionate he was about himself <laughs> and, and uh, using science to diagnose himself. And it was because the doctors couldn't diagnose him, so he turned himself into an experiment. Um, but uh, Paraview is a, a really awesome tool for doing, for doing that. Um, the last, oh, and see, here's an example of using it for 3D MRI MRI like data and you can play it and it'll explain everything. The last thing I want to say about Paraview is that underneath Paraview it's based on this tool called VTK, the Visualization Toolkit. This is the most widely used API for scientific visualization. So any commercial visualization tool, chances are underneath the skirt is VTK at uh, doing all the work. That is completely open source. It was funded by the Department of Energy. And should you ever want to venture into writing code, either for C++, JavaScript, Python, uh, Tickle TK, you know, Shell, Script, uh, VTK will do that for you. Reason pair of you exist or came out after VTK was that a lot of scientists can't code in C++ and they only know Fortran, right? Um, and, and so Paraview was a way to allow them to do these advanced visualizations without having to know how to code. Okay, any questions? So with that, I'm going to stop talking and uh, Akib, I think you wanna talk about Tableau? And you're welcome again to download Paraview, try Plotly for yourselves, uh, just play through them. Uh, if you happen to think you might need this in the future. So hi everyone. This is the second part of the presentation. So today's workshop, I'm gonna be presenting Tableau. Uh, this is a no code uh, graphing interface. So if you are like the guy, I don't want to code. So this is a good place for you. It has a lot of uh, options. So uh, you can choose between the options as long as uh, the graph supports your data. So we'll go through that. And first of all, uh, we'll need a data set. I think you all have, uh, you all have the data set uh, sent to you as email. If you haven't, uh, I'll send a link in the chat so that you can have it. So I have the link sent uh, both in the chat and the uh, data science fellow group. So it will be easier for you to follow up. So when you start Tableau, uh, you'll end up with a page like this. Uh, I've put marks uh, for the zoom people to follow along so where i have put the arc one these are the uh, these are the file data that we can connect so we have csv files like dot hyper files which is uh, local to tableau and uh, there can be uh, tab separated files a lot of files there can be a lot of files containing our data so we can connect those data with uh, 
the data types uh, mentioned in section one. Section two has uh, server connections. So if we have a MySQL server or database, uh, some sort of database that is hosted somewhere in the server, in any server, then we can use the section marked with two. For uh, the previously opened uh, workbooks that we have previously worked on, we can use the section marked with three. And the section marked with four has like many resources that you can get started with using. So suppose you have a file that is not mentioned in the left panel, right? So suppose you have a dot hyper file. You don't see anything like that in the list. So you can just click more and it will pop up a window for you where you, will just, you can just browse your files and see uh, what is available for you. And for same with the server, if you don't see the server you are looking for, you can just click on more and it will pop up a list of 73 servers that is for the version I'm using, which is of 22. And it has most of the big uh, databases that people use, like there's Google BigQuery, there's uh, Google Drive, MySQL, and any sort of web connector that you can use to connect the data. And even if you don't have the desired connection available in the whole list, then you can create a new connector and uh, you can use that. Uh, I'm not covering how to create a new connector. There are, uh, there are a lot of uh, resources available online for that. First of all, we are gonna load our data. So uh, the data I have shared with you is a CSV file. Uh, most of the time we open the CSV file with Microsoft Excel, but be careful. Uh, the CSV actually comma separated values, which is a text file. And to load that, we'll just click the text file, mark with one, and then just select the file and open it. When we have our data opened, then uh, it will give you a dashboard like this one. This dashboard covers uh, multiple things. So first, the one marked section, uh, if I can, the one marked section, uh, this one has the connector you have used. You have used a CSV file connector, right? So this one has like the text file connector. So this one shows that is the text file and the file section on number two, it, it shows all the files that you have loaded. And here in the number, like the area mark with number three, it has all the fields and rows. Fields are actually the columns. That means uh, all these columns that we have, these are called fields uh, in the tutorial of Tableau. And the rows are like how many data set, how many data you have in this data set. And for number four, we have a gear sign where you can sort your data to have a better loop. So uh, you can like, sort it as an, in ascending order, in descending order, and there are multiple options you can use that. At the location with number five, you have the data types available of the fields. So if a data type is integer or like numbers, it will show numbers. If it's string, it will show string. There are multiple types available, like uh, there are date time, there is time, and there's also like, uh, geographical coordinates and all sorts of things. So we can use that to uh, have a better understanding of the data we have. Our main workspace, however, is down here. You'll see sheet one, like this is what they call the worksheets, our main workspaces where we'll be creating our uh, visualizations. So if you click that worksheet, it will open a new page like this one. Uh, this one has like the tables. These are all the columns and uh, these are all the columns we have. They were kind enough to separate the columns into two sections. The first one, they call it the dimensions and the second one they call the measures. So normally the dimensions go on the columns that means the x-axis and the 
values normally go on the y-axis. So they have separated the values that uh, makes more sense to be uh, like measures and the values they, that makes more sense to be dimensions. On number two, we have the rows and columns. We can drag and drop these uh, fields to this section to make a graph. As simple as that. No Python coding, no importing packages, nothing. We just import the data, go to the worksheets, and we just cop, like drag and drop all the fields in these sections to generate a presentation. On number three, the drop down menu, it says automatic. That means uh, it will automatically generate a graph for us that it sees fit. Like it can be a line graph, it can be a bar plot. Luckily, they don't have any pie charts. So <laughs> they uh, like this, if, if it's set to automatic, they will automatically feed the uh, best plot for us according to our data. And just under the automatic dropdown, there are some attributes. So they mentioned color, size, text. These are the attributes of the graph that we can change. Uh, we'll go through that uh, on details. So on the top right, there is a button called show me that actually shows you all the graphs that you can use for your data. And not, like at, at first, these are all disabled, but as you start putting your data inside the section two, the pros and columns, the, some of the graphs will be activated. And those graphs are the ones that go well with your data. And last but not least, there is a presentation button that you can go on a presentation mode, mode to uh, for a full screen view of your data. So first of all, let us generate our first plot. So let's just drag and drop the global cells on rows and genre on the columns. And you'll just see this graph magically appear in front of you. And you, you can also see like in the show me section, it has also activated a lot of options for us that we can choose. It has a pie chart, sorry, <laughs> I didn't uh, notice it first, but there are other options too. Uh, but remember that when you were like clicking through these uh, options, uh, they sometimes change the columns and rows to fit the data they are trying to show. So this may change while you're trying your uh, different plots. So be careful about that. So this is our first plot. Uh, would everybody follow till now? Okay. So in Zoom, uh, does anybody having any problem? Is anybody having any problem? So we have our first plot that uh, shows us like, for all the, oh, so first of all, this data contains uh, all the like game related stuff. So we have the game genres on the X axis while where we put genre on columns and we have the global sales on rows. So this is our global sales in millions. So this is our rows. So our height of our graph. So if we change the columns to year, just uh, what you can do is uh, you can click on genre and say remove and drag and drop year into columns. It will magically change your data to a line plot. Plot like this. So it will be a like, it will be a global sales on the y axis and year on the x axis plot. So you can change, you can see how much the cell has increased over the years. This data is still uh, 2017. So we don't have the COVID data. I think the plot would be, it would go much higher in COVID, uh, COVID time. So we have this plot, right? But it doesn't have much information in it. So what we can do is we can start using the marks section on the left-hand side uh, and start doing some crazy stuff. So we can drag and drop the genre and put it in the marks section. 
what it will do is it will break the line graph we had and divide it into multiple genre. And as we did, uh, as we saw like a little while ago, we can see this is a very bad graph. And if you have already generated the allergic uh, reaction to bad graphs, then some of you might be disgusted by it. So what we can do, we can change how it looks and give different genres, different colors. How do we do that? As you can see here, inside the genre, it, it, uh, it says, there's an icon, right? So the icon matches with details. We can just click on that icon and change it to color. And if we change it to color, then it will separate all the data and have different color for different genre. And we'll, we'll end up a graph, we will end up with a graph like this. So this graph is better than before, but still not informative enough, right? We don't have uh, any meaning of how, like what are these values we have to like put a scale or something to like uh, actual ruler, okay, physical ruler on top of the screen to see where this line matches. This line matches somewhere in one, 35 or something. So we want these values to be shown. We can do that by dragging and dropping. You see this global cells, some global cells. We can drag and drop the global cells. We can drag the global cells on top of level instead of just dropping it here in the empty box. We can drop in a top of level to make the tag level by default. And this will show us all sorts of values. First of all, like it will give you all the values it can see, so it will be a mess. So you can just click on level and like pick your poison. Like uh, you can choose anything you want here. Here I have uh, selected min and max because like I want the minimum and the maximum values of my graph. And I have selected line or pi because I want the maximum value and minimum value of each line. So what is showing is the maximum and minimum value of each genre. If we selected like something else here, if we selected the uh, line ends, that would, uh, that would have like the values of all the lines end value. And you can just play around with it and see what they give. But these are the main uh, fields that determine which values to show in the graph. So now we have like a beautiful graph that we can maybe put in our paper. The paper is about maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe how the games have been being, sell being sold every year. We are doing a comparative analysis or something. Now we have put year and global sales, right? We can just change, like we can just keep on adding variables to the rows and columns and change the graph like we fit. So for the rows, if we just like drag and drop genre here, that will give us a plot like that, which doesn't make much sense. But what it did, what it does is like for action, uh, it shows me the global cells. It plots the global cells by the year. So they have uh, multiple plots for all the genres that are available to us. So like this can be one thing. And we remember we put the, we, we put the genre in the rows. If we put the genre in the columns, it, does, it generates a different graph. So we can just put the genre in here. And what we can do is it will divide the year into different genres. And it will plot like uh, how much cell each uh, genre got in uh, throughout the years. But still, like we can do more stuff here. As you can see, there are no marks selected here. We can color different genres like we did before, and we can end up with a graph like this. 
if we just put, uh, we, if we just drag genre and drop it on colors, it will just magically change all your colors. Are you uh, following till now? I think uh, up till it's really uh, straightforward. Uh, is anyone having any trouble in the Zoom? So now we can hit things up a little bit more. So we have something called calculated fields. That means we can do some arithmetic operations or some, uh, we can put in some functions uh, inside the, uh, we, can, we can do those operations for those uh, fields we have. So we can just add two fields, we can multiply two fields, we can add some string with some fields. So suppose uh, we have the name, the name is like uh, the name of the games. So we can just add the platform with the name. So it will just say Grand Theft Auto instead, and we can change it to PC Grand Theft Auto or something. You can do all sorts of things. We can change the name to uppercase. We can change it to lowercase. There are a very big list of functions that you can do with Tableau. Tableau supports a lot of functions. I'm just showing the arithmetic ones here. So we want to see how much impact the Japanese sales had on the global sales. So what we're trying to do is we want to subtract the Japanese sales from the global sales and see how the graph is changed. So to do that, we can just click on the field that we want to work on. You want to subtract Japanese sales from global sales. So just left click on global sales, it will, uh, it will, uh, it will create a right, right click on global sales and it will create a option for you. There you'll find create and calculated fields. That will give you a field like this one. This is a simple coding pane. So it's not actually code, but uh, you can see like, if you do global sales minus JP sales, so JP sales is like, Another column we have here. So we're just subtracting these two cells. So this will give us another new cell, which is if we plot here. Oh, okay. So the name is exclude JP. So that is the name I've selected for the new field. So that field will be available in the fields list that you have here. So if we drag and drop that with the global cells, so it will create two different graphs. So as you can see, the top value for the global cells is 138.5 million and the top value for JP cells is 130 million. So that means like it didn't have that much of a big impact on the global cells. So now what you can try is create another uh, graph, like create another uh, like field and call it exclude NA. We have the NA cells uh, field here. So what you do, what you do is just follow the steps that we did for exclude JP and just subtract the NA cells from the global cells that will give you the impact of North America on the global sales. And you should end up with a graph like this. And one thing to notice is that the fields that you create by yourself will have an equal sign beside the icon. So it's a very small equal sign, so I don't know if you can see it, but there will be an equal sign right beside the icon. So you can distinguish between what are the fields that were generally there and what are the fields you have created yourself. So if you have created the graph, you'll see that North America was literally more than half of the global cells. They are the pure gamers. And the rest of the world were only 67 million. Uh, you can see that the scale has changed automatically. 
as the data has come down. And you can also like change the graph type to an area plot, and that will give you a very beautiful area plot. I don't have the image for that, but uh, it will create it. So you can just uh, try it by clicking. It's all about playing around and see uh, what are the functions you can come up with. So we're gonna move on to another plot that looks much more complex. So what we're doing here is basically nothing. We're just dragging and dropping genre on columns. The graphs we had already was divided into global cells, uh, exclude JP and exclude NA. We are just putting in genre on columns so that we have a genre wide, genre, genre based, genre separated graphs. So this graph is like, if we, if we want to do that in a code, it will take a lot of time, but we can just do it by dragging and dropping stuff. If you generate the this graph, then you might notice that you have the same values over uh, this the, the maximum and minimum points, like 139.4. You might have 139.4 uh, for the exclude JP and also 139.4 for the exclude NA. If that happens, that is because when you create this type of graphs, you will end up with uh, different marks in your uh, mark section. So you'll need to go inside each of them, each of the marks and click on the label and select which uh, graphs you want to pick. So if you, pre if you pick the correct graphs, so that like see here, I'm inside exclude NA and here I am plotting the levels from, for exclude NA. So for exclude NA, I'm getting the exclude NA excluded values. If I go inside exclude JP, it will show that I am plotting the sum of the exclude JP. If I go for go inside global cells, it will so it will show global cells. Uh, but for you, it might show global cells for, for all of them. You may need to change that. That's the end of the simple things Tableau can do. Here are a lot of complex things we can do in Tableau, but will be not will not be covering in the workshop because it can take about uh, one week to two weeks to cover everything about Tableau. So what we can do is we can give you some resources if you're interested to go through and uh, have a look at those resources so that if you have some spark of interest, uh, that is created in you about Tableau, that guides will like guide you to a flame of passion or something. So yeah, these are some uh, great visualizations that are created in Tableau. So you can like, this is the, this is the end line that you can do with Tableau. You can create these dashboards. You can create dashboards like that and put it in a website or something, put it in your portfolio or something. So, uh, Sometimes the like Tableau has so many uh, in, like options that sometimes it feels like you're only being limited by your imagination. So uh, you can make a lot of cool things with Tableau. And we have also shared like a YouTube video, YouTube series where you can uh, go and go on and like have a look at the different things that, that you can do. So, this is it for today's uh, workshop. If you have any questions in the Zoom or in the Zoom. Yes, yeah, sure. How much does it cost? So the Tableau is uh, actually, I don't remember how it costs, but if you are a student or a teacher, you can get a one year free license. You can apply for that, or you can have 14 days of free trial. Uh, they normally uh, accept your like request immediately. Like I got a reply within uh, about 30 minutes. 
um, <laughs> Jason didn't get a reply within two weeks. Uh, yes, yeah, so, I was over the holidays, so yeah, yeah, that might. Be. So uh, normally you get really first response from them, and normally you get accepted if you provide the academic email. They normally accept you, so you can get a free license for one year. And can you export it to a website where it's a dynamic file, like you can with Plotly, Jason should? Mm, or is it I, I haven't come across any. Uh, I haven't come across, come across any, but the company provides you with hosting services mm -hmm. or dashboards. Okay. That's where you have to pay. Yeah, that would get so. Yeah. They charge $70. Yeah. That's a yeah. $70 a month. But the, the really, the big key win, two key winning things on Tableau. If you scroll back to the top, is that huge list of uh, data services that it interfaces with. So, like if you scroll down, I think when you were showing that chart, uh, that uh, no, that one. You just missed it. Let's go up. That one, the blue one. Oh, see all those online services for hosting data. Normally, you know, as a as a programmer, we have to go through the trouble to look at the API to figure out how do I access the data, how do I match it, import it to the right data format. Hello, this has been it's a company. Its business is to service as many other companies as possible, and most companies will work will have like Amazon cloud services, and so they've done all that hard work for you. So if you want to host your data on something, you have an easy way to get to it. That's the big win. Uh, the other big win is uh, in the beginning where you're loading the data set, you can build a dish, uh, like data processing pipelines, right? Before you actually go and start making the charts. And that's basically the replacement for how you would you do a lot of Python coding. Yeah, like here you can do some stuff. Like uh, suppose you have uh, two tables, Two different tables containing two different data and you want to join them yeah you can you can join the tables uh just like you do in sql uh, so if you're familiar with sql you'll have an easier time doing uh, complex stuff but uh if you're not then it does it visually so it's easier than programming so you can just see and uh, you can just like drag a table and drop here in this field in the white field and it will automatically connect the, the, those two uh, tables. But if you do it in SQL, you will have to do a, like different four, three to four lines of command. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is simpler in that sense. And also like uh, if you have ever uh, loaded the SQL data, then you will see like it's really hard to like get connected. If you're not a software engineer, if you're a beginner, it's really hard to even connect to the SQL server. So there are some demo codes, but a lot of things can go wrong and you'll just not find your data. So uh, it makes a lot of things easy. If you are in a hurry, just want to get a graph out, you don't want to spend learning the programs or anything, I think this is a very good tool. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah,